Hey everyone, welcome to this lecture. We're going to be talking about one of my favorite aspects of filmmaking, which is editing. That's kind of what this whole module has been about is editing in case you haven't figured that out already. You're gonna to get to do some hands-on work. We're gonna talk a little bit about theory and practice and things like that. Um, I know that the process can seem a little intimidating if you've never used editing software like Premiere before, but believe me, if I can figure it out and I am kind of Mr. Anti-Technology, sort of a Luddite, um, I figured it out and so you can too. Um, but we're going to be talking a little bit here about some of the terminology behind everything and how editing works. Why I like it is because I found that editing is the final, uh, kind of like the final draft of a film. I love to write. That was one of my first passions. And editing is kind of like writing. You, you're kind of putting a finality to the story by putting all the pieces together. Sometimes you get in the uh, edit and something just doesn't work. You have to cut a scene down or cut a scene out. Believe me, it happens. It's happened with me. My thesis film, um, would probably be twice as long <laughs> um, if I had everything in there. My first feature probably has 10 deleted scenes. Um, so you edit out things that are unnecessary, things that don't serve the narrative. And as you're going forward and you're shooting your own uh, projects and you're editing your own, you might find that it's really hard to cut stuff that you worked hard on. So typically an editor is not on set, so they don't realize just how hard you worked for a shot. Um, where you're like, oh, that took us eight hours to get that like five second shot. We have to have this this whole scene in there, and an, an editor kind of comes in and they're not biased to the to the production. They're simply focused on the narrative. So they might say, hey, it's not serving the narrative. We don't need it. So I like that about editing that it it's focused solely on story, and it's keeping the audience in mind at all times. So what is editing? Um, Simply said, editing is the arrangement of shots spliced together in film. It could be done uh, by film, but now, of course, obviously, you know, it's mostly digital. Um, it creates tempo. Is it fast? Is it slow? Are there, you know, simple cuts? Are there a lot of transition? Uh, it can elicit meaning, bringing two shots together to form an idea. Um, and it drives the narrative. And that can be linear or nonlinear, like a flashback or um, something like that. So very powerful tool for filmmaking. Uh, editing for continuity is, when, when we're talking about this, editing sort of undergone a rebirth, I guess. I don't know how to put this, but I think it's gotten a lot more stylized, whereas when you're kind of first coming in to know and understand these terms, you want to kind of stick with the foundational elements. So we're kind of talking about classical Hollywood cinema in a lot of what we do. I think now um, with the birth of all these Netflix platforms and Amazon Prime and everything like that, there's a lot more to editing. Um, it's a lot more complex. Stories are a lot more complex and things like that. Um, so, but if we're, if we're talking about it just in its most simple terms, um, we edit for continuity, um, meaning that we don't want these unnatural gaps in space or time. We want things to seem continuous because if we're taken out of space or time, um, we become aware we're watching a movie. and We lose the fact that we are in a story. We're invested. We're kind of sucked into the screen and in this world. And we want our edits to be hidden, as it were. Now, that gets broken a lot, and I think we've gotten used to the breaks and things like jump cuts and stuff like that. Um, and we'll go over what those terms are in just a minute. But in its most simple terms, we want things to seem like there's a continuity to it. So, um, for instance, someone can leave, uh, leave home and go to the park. This may actually take several minutes, you know, if we were to actually leave and go somewhere. <laughs> and the dog started barking. So you'll probably see a jump cut there, which will be a good example. Um, 
there to there. Uh, but anyway, someone can leave home and go to the park. This may actually take several minutes um, to be accomplished, but film can do it, you know, in a second. If somebody says, I'm going to the park, and you see them in their home, and the next shot is you see them in the park, we're naturally going to assume that they got there. Their mode of getting there, probably not important. If it was important, it'd be in the film. But we don't want to just sit there and arbitrarily be watching somebody walk to a park. So that's kind of, we're not taken out of it though. Like we don't need unnecessary information. We get it. They went to the park. They got there. Um, I see that a lot with a lot of first time filmmakers is they're worried that the audience is going to be confused what's going on. Um, but you got to trust your audience is, is smarter um, than you might think. Um, screen direction can also help maintain this continuity. So watching which side of the screen people enter and exit and maintaining um, a sort of continuous flow. I didn't realize this even after probably two or three screenings of it, but in Lord of the Rings, they're always moving left to right. The hobbits, um, everybody, kind of, there's kind of a left to right movement, um, especially the hobbits. And if you look at a map of the world, it makes sense that they would be doing that. They're constantly moving east until the third movie, they're moving back west. And it's just kind of a subtle thing like that, that you're like, okay, that that continuity is maintained. So it's something to be aware of as you're getting your shots first and editing second. So editing starts with a cut. And if we think of it in film, and not to date myself, but um, I had to use one of these machines, the splicer, when I first went to college, we shot on a 16 millimeter. Um, and you use this kind of clear tape with sprockets to tape to splice your shots together. So you would cut, and there'd be a razor that come down, and it would cut the film, and then you would bring the two pieces together. Um, so hence why they call it a cut, because you're cutting the film. Um, and now with digital, it's non-destructive, right? So when I'm editing in Premiere, I'm not actually manipulating the clips, I'm telling the software where that footage is being housed in the computer and go and pick apart these few seconds and then glue them together in the export. So it's a non-destructive way of editing. But it all kind of starts with that cut. So when we're deciding where to cut, again, we want that classic Hollywood style we don't necessarily want to be taken out of the moment. We want our editing to seem hidden. We almost don't want to be aware of it. So one of the most important things is cutting on action. So if a hand is kind of moving in, you know, right to left, we find the point in shot one. So it's like we come in. And then now right here we want to go to shot two. We have to find that spot in shot two where the arm is raised and we match to it. It's also important why you maintain continuity on set when you're getting the shots. There are people in film called script supervisors and they are meticulously watching every aspect of what the actors do to make sure that the action is maintained so that when you do get to the edit, it's like if somebody's throwing a punch with the right hand in one shot and then they do it again from a different angle and they're swing with their left it's not going to match up um, but assuming all of our um, continuity is matched on set then we want to cut on the action in the shot um, we want to maintain a believable movement from one moment to the next otherwise it's going to cause things to jump if an arm is here and the next shot it's here um, you know it's not gonna it's, it's like something's gonna be off Okay, so right now is a good time to pause this and go into, um, I'll even show you, go into um, your module two, go into lectures and watch example video one. So you can pause this one, go over and watch this. Okay, so now that you're back, hopefully you watched it and uh, got some knowledge out of it. Uh, I should have told you to, it's rated PG-13, so uh, hopefully you saw that 
on there. I've had just just in case it is it is online. Um, I think one time I had somebody watch it and they had little kids in the room or something. So from that experience, I've learned to kind of give a rating behind things. But um, so you learned about things like jump cut, which is that that break in space and time continuity. You can always I don't want to say rules are always meant to be broken, but there are times you can do a jump cut where things can make sense. And that's one of the things I think now when I was referencing back to like Netflix and Amazon, how rules are just kind of more and more broken. If you watch, it's like kind of loaded with jump cuts now. And that 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 break in time, we're a little bit more uh, numb to it, I guess you could say. We're a little bit more aware of the fact that it's present and it just doesn't phase us like probably you know would have 30 20 30 40 50 years ago where it's like there's a lot of jump cuts here it's a bit much but now we're kind of like eh we we don't even really bat an eye to it um so um it can give you uh, a way of moving your story forward it can it can it can help it can help serve to tell your narrative you just want to be aware of when to use it and when not to reaction shots um they are what they sound like action happens and we cut to the reaction of somebody um and and we we align with how somebody reacts it's in horror films are reaction shots something scary happens cut to a reaction of the characters because we're aligned with them and their feeling and their emotion at a given time. So we want to know what are they going through? How are they reacting to this new information that's presented? A lot of first time filmmakers too, they don't have a lot of reaction shots and I think it's very essential. And when you start to realize your main characters, we want to know how they're reacting to things at almost every important new given information we want to know how how are they thinking about it so here is an example of back to the future um, a scene with and without reaction shots hey mcfly i thought i told you never to come in here <laughs> well it's gonna cost you how much money you got on you well how much you want biff all right, punk. Now, I'm whoa, gonna... whoa, Biff. What's that? That's Calvin Klein. Oh my god, he's a dream. Whoa, whoa, kid, kid, stop, stop. Okay, so let's go to here. Now, let's watch it with those reaction shots in there. Hey, McFly! I thought I told you never to come in here. <laughs> well, it's gonna cost you. How much money you got on you? Well, how much you want, Biff? <laughs> Now, whoa, gonna... whoa, Biff. What's that? Yeah. That's Calvin Klein. Oh my God, he's a dream. Whoa, whoa, kid, kid. All right, cool story. The guy who played Biff, Tom Wilson, he was one of my teachers when I went to screenwriting school out in LA. He looks the same, too, which is crazy. Okay, we can see. Um, by removing those reaction shots, that first scene is just flat, right? There's nothing to it. We have nothing to um, kind of clue us in. It it's a, turns it into a rather clunky scene, but we want to know these main characters. How are they reacting? Because it gives it a lot more of an emotional depth as to what's going on. I think it's one of those things, too, that's sort of like... I'm trying to consider when I first started editing when I first started shooting you almost might think of reaction shots as being unnecessary like why do I need so like that scene there's a fight of course your audience is going to react in a certain way but 
just remember a story is all about going on a journey with a character or characters and we identify with them we align with them so their reaction shots are very powerful um and we get to understand them more and we get to go on a much deeper and richer journey with them by knowing how they feel um at a at a given time so those reaction shots are actually quite powerful um a match cut again if you just watch those things you that that example video you you know what these are but um match cuts are very i think um important too and don't overuse them they're a nice spice on your on the totality of your edit um and it's i think one of those things it's got to be done by design and to help you kind of further your story in a, in a much deeper way a cutaway again these are important to get if you ever think you want to shoot a scene in one shot if you're ever like i'm going to do this all in one get cutaways get cutaways of of some kind because um what happens or what can happen i've seen this happen a lot is if we think of your shot as um the space between my hands and we break it down into two part a part b inevitably there'll be something like you'll say oh the the start of of a is good in take one but i like i like b in take two how do i get those two together a cutaway now i can make it seem like one seamless shot um spielberg uses one shot all the time it's very hard to do i've only ever like intentionally gone in and said i'm just using one take or i want this all in one shot um no maybe twice and i knew it ahead of time once was for a laugh once was i um i'll show his examples i know one that you're gonna watch later on but um i'll show him later but anyway <laughs> that's called a one -er, just doing it in one shot get cutaways uh you know when you can they become important um cross cutting again cutting to another location and character coming back and forth uh, between two areas transitions fade in and fade out um not always but to me any kind of a fade or a dissolve has an implication of time passing in some way so i see people use a fade often but just know if you're fading from one thing to the next it's going to it's kind of psychologically representative of time passing so be aware how often you're using it um at the end of the day you're the artist so if you want to use it you can but you want your audience engaged so don't over don't overuse it don't assume you have to start out with a fade in and don't assume you have to end with a fade out audio transitions um, the L cut audio carrying over from one shot to the next um, this is specifically um, you know going between different scenes um, it can be from the same location but not always so um, L and J so just think if you're looking at it in terms of on your on your edit um, you know is the audio kind of starting down here and coming over or back and you know back and forth um it gives it a nice layered dimension and you don't have to always do a transition between scenes sometimes even dialogue if you cut right when somebody starts the next line you know just two people talking it can be a little bit mundane so if one person is talking and somebody else is about to you might you know and it's important that we see them take in the information you might cut to them before they start talking while person a is finishing talking so we're hearing that dialogue underneath but we're seeing person two um and we're seeing them collect all the information just something to consider so it's not like a tennis match back and forth this person talks this person talks this person talks um okay walter merch um is a rather famous uh editor i looked up he's done a lot of stuff for francis ford coppola um, over the years um, and 
he kind of went on this quest to discover how and why we cut where films are cut. Um, what I want you to take away from this is he comes up with six different uh, levels to find the right cut. Emotion, story, rhythm, eye trace, two-dimensional plane, three-dimensional plane. Okay, I will um, have a video here and it is example video two merch. I will tell you this too, is you may want to reference um, back to the camera lecture for the 180 degree rule. Um, but go ahead, pause right here and come back and um, finish up the rest. That is merch um, and his six kind of levels of finding the perfect uh, cut. One more thing I wanted to talk about um, with him is keeping your audience in mind all the time. So a cut at the wrong time, or not, not even necessarily the wrong time, but a cut at two different places can mean two different things. It can change the way we feel about the story, about a, a character. Um, it, it's very kind of a powerful thing. So really be aware of where your story is at and um, keeping your audience in mind for choosing why am I making the cut right here. So keeping all of that in mind as you're deciding what you want to do and you should be good to go. Make sure you watch those example videos and it will, I think, greatly help you going forward with telling your own stories. All right, I'll see you at the next lecture.